Já, ég ætla bara að bjóða okkur hjartalega, hjartalega velkomin á þessa kynningu hjá okkur í dag sem að fjallar um stendur þeim á skjánum um, um tækni ABB í HVDC og þá möguleika sem það hefur verið upp að bjóða fyrir okkur Íslendinga við reyndum að horfa svona til þess og þegar við fórum að stað með að huga að þessari ammæli starfskrá okkur í vor og þá vorum við svona að horfa stoltið til að horfa til framtíðar með rafmagni og rafmagni búið að vera í rafmagni í 80 ár og vildum þá koma með kynningar til ykkar á Íslandi eitthvað sem að, að væri framtíðar spekulasjónir og það er búið að vera svona þema alla vikuna og heldur áfram svo á morgur uh, Þetta er sem sagt tækni sem er náttúrulega búið að vera til lengi og kannski tengist okkur mest uh, þessi sífelda umræða um að tengja okkur við Evrópunetið og fara að flytja út orð en það eru líka aðri möguleikar í þessu sem að sem að er HDC Light sem að við komum að Gunnar fyrir hérna á eftir því kynni á eftir og og þá möguleika sem eru þar en við erum hérna með góðan gest frá ABB HDC í Lútvika í Svíþjóð sem er sérfræðingur á þessu sviði og ætlar að fara og leiða þetta þetta er svona kannski með vonandi einhver umræður og ég bara hvet ykkur til að vera ófeimnir eða ófeimin við að, hérna, að spyrja eins mikið við ykkur dettur í hug við getur vonandi svara því öllu og hérna þetta er svona sirka einn og hálfur, einn og hálfur klukkutími sem að þetta tekur uh, but we have a very good uh, friend here from uh, ABB in, in ATTC in, in Lutica that will have, have this uh, presentation. Uh, his name is Gunnar Persson, Persson and uh, I wish him very welcome. I'm glad to, to have you here and uh, we'll take over from here. Thank you, my lord. And um, I'm very <coughs> thankful for that uh, you are a name, Gabe of the opportunity to present the HVDC technology here and uh, I'm also glad that you are spent so many people are here listening to this short technology easy technology and experience from ABB and I will cover both uh, the HVDC converters as well as the HVDC cables and uh, we have approximately two hours yeah, yeah. for this and uh, if there are any questions please interrupt me soon uh, in my presentation here and uh, i hope that you can hear me now so uh, if i speak too loud you have to tell me the about behind and um, with that, I will start here. <coughs> uh, I will have a short introduction of the ABB, HVDC. We will go through the HVDC technologies and the HVDC cables. And the cable part is rather extensive. So I suggest that after that, we take a five minutes leg stretch and then we continue with the HVDC light technology, the applications, our experience and what we can think about in the future. Um, you know, we have had a very long history in ABB and uh, both uh, our mother companies, uh, BBC from Switzerland and ASEA in Sweden, they are very much based on innovation from the beginning with the three-phase systems and the three-phase motors, generators, etc. And you can see here, from the uh, beginning of the 19th century, we have a lot of technology innovations. We came with the HVDC in the mid-50s. We have the gas insulated switchgear, we have the industrial robots. 
And today we have also what we say, ultra high voltage, which means uh, over 1000 kV on both AC and DC. And uh, best innovation is ABB. These uh, advantage at competitive edge. And we invest a lot of money and we have resources and uh, laboratories all over the world. And we have also collaboration with a lot of universities. So we spend a lot of money in R&D to develop new products. When we come to the HVDC and the grid systems, which consist of the HVDC part of the facts, which is the series and shunt compensation system group. We have the high voltage cable within the grid system, which are working with, we have also the application offshore wind connections. We do manufacture our own semiconductors within ABB, especially uh, developed for high voltage, high power applications. And I think that's rather unique. And we have also a consulting and service uh, unit. Uh, and then I think we should also mention our place, ABB in Ludvika, Sweden. This is the world center of high voltage. And it's one of the success, one of the reasons for the success of the HVDC is that we have within a diameter of one kilometer in the area here, uh, a lot of equipment and components that we are using in HVDC, developed by our colleagues in, for example, transformers, uh, bushings, circuit breakers, surgery resters, uh, etc. And we have also within ABB a global responsibility for most of those products. So here we have the melting pot for high voltage equipment and high voltage system within ABB. And as you can see also we have also high voltage laboratories and high power laboratories and we also have the Swedish Transmission Research Institute here and this is uh, very important for us to be in the forefront of new technologies that we develop not only within HEDC also our colleagues that supply equipment develop their products for us uh, we started already in 1954 with the first commercial HVDC. At that time, it was with mercury valves. Then, in this 1970, came the thyristor. And uh, if we go through this, we can see also we started with what we call the HVDC light which is the brand name of the ABB's voltage source converters uh, more than 1997. And uh, 2007, we had the first test circuit for 800 kV DC installed. Why do we have seen such a growth in HVDC connections the last decade. Well, everybody is talking about the greenhouse effect, the uh, uh, reduction of CO2, and the renewables are normally located very far from the consumption centers. In order to increase the renewables, we need to transport bulk the energy from the large rivers in Brazil 
India, China, etc., through the consumption centers, uh, thereby reducing our fossil energy. We have also the wind power, offshore wind power in the North Sea. Germany and England, UK are investing a lot of money in that today. And the only way to bring the power to shore is to use HVDC. And in the future, we will eventually see also solar, wave, tidal, geothermal, those uh, renewable resources are also located far away from the consumption centers. So we need to transport energy in an efficient and cost, low cost way. What is then an HVDC system? Well, we have one grid and we connect that grid by converting the power from AC into DC, then we transmit the DC power either through cables, submarine, or underground, or, or headlines, or a combination of those to the next grid, where we convert it back to AC. And since we control the power and the energy direction by the voltage on the DC line, uh, we have a much better controllability than you have for AC. And we can also transmit energy from be between two asynchronous networks. For example, if you have 50 hertz here and 60 hertz here. Uh, another advantage is that if you have a disturbance in that network, that disturbance will affect the voltage and the variations here. But that will not be transmitted to the other network. The DC link acts as a, acts as a firewall between the systems. And you can also, since we can control the power, we can also support a weak network with the HVDC link, especially during disturbances, by uh, modulating the power energy input and the voltage in the weak system. Uh, another thing is that by using HVDC, we can reduce the number of overhead lines. That means we can reduce the width of the, uh, what you say, right away. For example, if we should transmit uh, 2000 megawatt on uh, 500 kV, we normally need three parallel or headlines with the series compensation reduce the number to two lines if we go for HVDC five plus minus 500 kV we can have only one line and if you don't want to see the line you can bury it and have underground cables Uh, the technologies we're talking about is what we say HVDC class, classic for bulk transmission over long distances. Uh, it's a thyristor controlled and uh, we control the reactive power by switching in capacity <coughs> banks and filters. And uh, this technology has almost 50 years now, been since with the thyristor control came in the 70s. Uh, typical design is that we have a valve hole and then we have a huge switch yard with the capacitor banks and filters for reactive power compensation of the converter itself. 
Uh, the new technology, the VSC technology, the HVDC light, is a transistor for IEBT control voltage source converters. Today, up to 1200, 1500 megawatt. Uh, here, we can also control the reactive power. So it acts as a synchronous generator in the system. And we can also, it doesn't need any short circuit level on the receiving end. We can use the black star capability and most of the equipment are located indoors since we are not, there is no need of filter or capacitor banks. So the size will be considerably less compared to a similar of the HVDC <coughs> classic type. We can also use here the new type of cable, XLP. E, plastic insulation cables. And we can see here, traditionally also for long cables, it has been used with HVDC Classic. And, uh, but we see today a trend that more and more of the cable links in Europe are today offered as HVDC, with the HVDC light technology. So, to summarize here the HVDC technology, what makes it special compared to AC? For long distances, high power, it's a lower investment and lower losses. You can connect asynchronous networks and you can, if you have what we call embedded parallel DC links with existing AC links, you can improve the stability and the transmission capability since you can control the power flow, thereby uh, in, thereby for, you can have a higher load angle since you can control the power during disturbances, etc. And you get three up to three times more power in a right way uh, with an AC transmission. Then the new technology, HVDC light. On top of this, we can have these extruded light cables, which are very suitable also for underground cables instead of overhead lines. And you can combine them with overhead lines if you want. You can connect to passive loads. That means that you can have radial feeding, an island, and uh, oil and gas platform, or whatever. And you can control the active and reactive power independently. No questions so far? What's a short delivery time? Yes. Um, I hope it isn't too early after lunch to fall asleep here. <laughs> um, now I will have a long cable description here. And it's a lot of pictures. So I will go through them rather quickly. But it will give you a view since cables is not only production of cable, it's a lot of installation work linked to this. And uh, our factory, main factory within ABB for high voltage cables and high voltage DC cables are located in the south of Sweden here, Karlskrona. And we have the accessory, accessories for cables, that means terminations and joints are located in Allingsås, close to Gothenburg. <coughs> While we in Ludvika are here somewhere, 100 kilometers northwest from Stockholm. 
We have also a rather new factory in uh, Huntersville in the uh, US for LAN cables. Since the demand for cables has been increasing the last decade, I think it's a general trend in the world that we have a cablification on all voltage levels today. People in many countries don't like or have lines. They want to have them, they want to bury the transmission lines by cabling. And the Karlskrona factory is located close to the shore. I will show you later why, since you can load the cable installation boats with the big drums of cables. And here we are producing both standard AC cables, but also DC cables, both submarine and underground high voltage cables. And the factory is, I would say, very much concentrated on submarine cables. And it will double the capacity it, by investments. I think they invested more than 400 million US the last three years. So by the end of 2015, they will have doubled the capacity. And as I mentioned here, it, how long does it, how long does it take on, on a single boat? Uh, the boat, depending on how big the boat is. But if, for example, uh, the law, one of the largest boats takes about 9,000 tons of cable can carry. And if you calculate that the cable, the submarine cable, has a weight of depending on which type of cable, but say 50 kilo per meter or 50 ton per kilometer, and you have 9,000 ton, 500, 5,000, that's 100, that's close to 200 kilometers of cable. Now it must be more. Uh, I was in California in 2002. Yes. Then a 270 cable was about uh, 25 kilometers. 200. 220 kV cable. But then you talked the about AC cables, three phase. Yeah. Then you talked about this type of model. And that is only for short distances. You can't the transmit. Five, I think you, said. you can't transmit so much power. What I'm talking about is this type of cable. I think I will come back to that later. So, coming back to that question, uh, say less than 50 kilos per 50 tons per kilometer, uh, 500 tons will be 10 kilometers. Yes, 200, 200 kilometers plus, I would say. Uh, the system here, well, we have the cable, of course. Need to have joints, either factory joints, which are not visible at all, or sometimes you need, for example, if you have a longer, you need, you need to go two, two times with a the bolt. Then you need to have a prefabricated joint or do a joint, a subsea joint. And then we have the termination, which is very where you go from high voltage, here it's an insulator with a conductor inside, very similar to an instrument transformer. And if you want to go for a two back over to an overhead line or a switch yard here. So it's a complete system and uh, I would say the most tricky thing is the installation work. Product range here is, we talked about the mass impregnated cable, which is uh, what we say paper lapped, paper insulation. Then it's uh, in 
impregnated in a resin high temperature and this is stable at then uh, maximum temperature stable up to 60 70 degrees then we have what we call the extruded hudc light cable for hudc here we have the core uh, xlp for ac and we have the three core or lower voltages for AC. Um, the conductor in the cables can be either of aluminium or copper. Traditionally, it was copper for submarine cable and aluminium for land cables. But with the increased copper cost versus the aluminium cost, we today also offer aluminium cables for uh, sea cables. I will go through the system here, but they, they are normally triple extruded insulation with it. They have the conductor, you have the conductor screen, you have a polymer insulation, and then you have an insulation screen. Then you normally have a sea cable uh, lead sheet. <coughs> Then you finish with a steel armory and an outer jacket to protect the cable. Uh, we have also a lot of cable accessories from Allen Source for these cables. And they are working very much in the middle voltage. And, but they also have accessories for high voltage and HVDC. Uh, for example, here we can see a termination of 450 kV HVDC cable. We also have prefabricated joints, flexible joints. And the cable production, how you produce a cable is rather logic, I would say. You start with a conductor. You have a conductor screen, which is semi-conducting. Uh, then you put on the insulation, then you have a semiconducting screen again. Then you have some kind of bedding before you put up the copper screen if it's a LAN cable. Then you have another bedding, then you have the lead sheet, and then the outer sheet. And then you continue with armoring if, if it's a submarine cable. Manufacturing. I will show you quickly uh, some slides from the manufacturing of the cable. Here you uh, take the conductor, and it's made of a lot of, it's like a rope. You twist it so you get the complete conductor. Uh, then you, and so this is for the mass impregnated cable. A lot of paper on for insulation purpose. You uh, transfer that into a large, I would say, coil or something, where you then impregnate the cable. And that must be done during controlled humidity and temperature, as for all other paper and oil insulated products, like transformers, also, we have an impregnation tank here, where you impregnate the paper. And then you cool it down. Then it's ready for the lead extrusions. And uh, finally, you do the armoring, single or double layer of, of armoring, depending on the mechanical requirements on the cable. And then storage before loading onto a ship. And you can see the storage here, it's very similar what they have on the ship. It's a rotating drum where you store it and on the ship you have a similar rotating drum to so load the boat by rotating both drums simultaneously. And then when you lay the, install the cable in the sea, 
do it the same way. Um, if we talk about the design of the cable, it must be designed both thermal, dielectrical, and mechanical. We start with the thermal design. It's rather obvious that the higher current, the higher ambient temperature, the less space, and the, if you have a good thermal conductivity in the soil or not, it will give the conductor size in order not to uh, exceed the maximum allowed temperature of the conductor during service. And this is according to IEC standards and it's done. It's pure mathematics, I would say. Uh, the electrical withstand, then we have to look into the operation voltage and also the other voltages that might occur during switching of the cable and if it's not, it can be subjected to lightning strokes as well. And this will give, give a thickness of the insulation, also quite obvious, obviously. Mechanical design is also, I would say, the water depth. The cable must be strong enough to, bear, to uh, carry its own weight during installation. And if you have a depth of 2,000 meters, and you have a cable that has a weight of 100 kilos per meter, then you can easily think that the armory must be very strong in order to carry the weight of the cable itself during installation. Another thing is if you have a lot of fishing activities or other submarine activities, then might you in to reinforce the cable and uh, also how you install the cable, how easy you can bury it on the seafloor and how deep you can bury it on the seafloor. Uh, yes, here you can see again the same cable. Here you can see that we have two armory and you can see that they are oriented on two directions here. So the forces should take out, the torque should be neutralized by the inner and outer layer of the cable. When you install the cable, you must do, before you install it, you must do an, what we call a marine survey. And uh, that you do normally do in steps. I mean, it's easy to install a cable if you have a soft, flat uh, seafloor compared to if you have a complicated seafloor with a lot of coral reefs, boulder, boulder stones, and heavy slopes. Do you normally start with a desktop study to find out where can we find a possible route for the cable. You use a lot of public source research reports, sea charts, diving reports, etc. And the result is also do you find any wrecks or any fishing activities, etc. The next is to go more detailed with a ship that do a survey, investigate the water very uh, good to check everything and it takes samples of the sea bottom and the material to find the thermal conductivity, etc. And you get the result is a detailed 
seafloor contour report. And here it's an advice, since we have a lot of customers who say this is easy for you to do, but it's very difficult if you don't have a good survey, you can have a lot of surprises. We normally say if you spend one dollar on marine survey, that saves you at least ten dollars of trouble. Uh, then you also take probes, and it's normally done on by remotely operated vehicles it, on the sea floor. You check yes what you can do here. Geology, landfall condition. Landfall can also be tricky, depending on how the <laughs> shore looks like. Tide, current. Finally, you end up with a route, and you will avoid problems, of course. When it comes to installation, then it's not only an installation ship. You have a more or less a ten to twenty different vessels in an installation operation. From uh, inspection vessels, uh, boats that <coughs> clear the area from other activities and uh, you need to have a lot of boats. And here are some examples of boats. This one of the newest one, the AMC Connect, where you can see the uh, drum here. This drum takes 6,000 tons of cable. Uh, when it comes to burying the cable, you need also special vessels, I would say. And it requires certified personnel. Normally, we also have from our ABB, we take care of the site management, of service agreements. The cable laying itself, you take the cable here from the drum, goes up on a long bale belt, and you, you need to keep a certain uh, tension in the cable and you must not uh, exceed the minimum radius of the cable during the operation. So it's, uh, you need good weather conditions. And we normally talk about weather windows for laying cables. And in the North Sea, it's in the summer. Now it's too late with the storms and everything. So we need to produce the cable all over the year, then it's loaded from May to August. And then they do the installation works then from May to September. Uh, you can see also shallow water cable installation, then you have to pull the cable from sea to shore. When it comes to protection, that is the basic idea. Dig down the cable, so it can't be to mechanical damage. You can have trencher, and you can see also here, this is for trenching also through soft rocks. It's like a motor saw, big motor saw that can trench also through sandstone, etc. Normally you want to have the cable buried at least one meter below the seafloor. You can do plowing if it's soft or jetty, or if you can't do it, maybe you have to make a, put blocks or a, mats of uh, over the cable. Very deep. 
I think it's below 1500 meters, then you normally don't have to protect the cable because there are normally no activities at that depth. Some small pictures from different equipment used. Low, you see a long flow as well. In shallow water, it can be tricky if you have moving sand dunes under the seabed because if you bury the cable too, if you have a lot of sand onto the cable, then the uh, thermal resistance will increase and you will have a you need to reduce the ampacity of the cable. Sometimes you need also to have concrete slabs to keep the cable in place. The reason is, of course, if you have fishing activities, it should not affect the cable. If you have a lot of pack ice, it should not affect the cable. If you have seabed movements and you start here with a cable, it can, if the sand moves away, suddenly it's open in the sea. So there are very much to think of. You need also to cross pipelines or other existing cables. Um, and the HVDC light cables are tested now to up to or down to 2,000 meters depth. Here you can see also this jetting or mass flow excavation. You have the cable here, and then you water jetting on the cable. So this will be like a fluid uh, sand or the sea bottom. And then the cable sinks down, and then it will be, it will be buried. Sand goes back. In that was submarine cables. When it comes to <coughs> underground cables, onshore cables, uh, there are also a lot of different technologies. You can have an open trench, excavate, pull the cable in, and fill back. Uh, you can also use uh, uh, directional drilling for river and road crossings, and you can also have what we call a cable plow. You can plow down the cable directly in the ground. And it, it, you can see this. Do it in one moment. Excavate laying and backfill in one operation. You see the cable on top of this machine here. It goes this direction. So in one operation only. Cities and uh, heavy populated area, you have problems more than you must in a slow way and you normally have a lot of or manual operations needed here. <clears throat> Road crossings, either horizontal direct drilling or you can bury it in other ways. River crossings. And in Karlskrona, there is also a training center for installation methods when it comes to jointing and termination of cables. That has to be done in the, by skilled and educated people. And normally we have supervisors on site in the field, but we need also to train the people that has to that are going to do the jointing and uh, 
terminations. How long does that take? Training, I suppose. I don't know. And but, uh, a weekend I, or a year? Hmm? Yeah. One weekend or is it a year? No, no. The training is normal. I think it's a three to five days course, training course. And it's normally decided how many people should be trained, etc. When you do the contract on the cable, when you supply the cable, be by ABB people only, or if the client, or the customer also should be involved in that. So, in order to have a robust cable system, it's not only to supply the cable, you must design the cable according to the requirements. You must have installation equipment and installation methods that secure that the cable will be laid and installed in a proper way and it's secured during the lifetime from mechanical problems there. And ABB is a complete supplier for cable systems. Everything from system studies down to the installation and we can also do repair of cables and we have service agreements. Many customers. So we have a short mobilization time in case of a failure of the cable. Question. Yes. Uh, what is the expected life length of uh, such cable installations? I know it's a bit different. But... Mm -hmm. uh, we normally we say once the cable is correctly installed and buried, um, the failure rate is almost zero because it is tested dielectrically when it is delivered from the factory. And you'd also do a new dielectrical test when it's installed. Uh, so then it's only subject to, I would say, mechanical forces during the lifetime. It can be current if it's a free cable or bendings and things, vibrations, etc. But uh, then I think also we need to consider the different type of insulations. If we talk about a mass impregnated cable, which has a paper insulation, then we know, for example, from transformers or whatever, we have a degradation of the insulation due to heat during the lifetime. But then we're talking about 40, 50, 60 years or something like that, depending also in which, what is the normal service temperature, how hard is you running the cable compared to the design, how it's this, what is this designed for. If it's full load or if it's only 50% of the current that will of course influence the lifetime and the degradation of the insulation material. For the extruded cable with the XLP plastic, I'm not sure about the degradation of that <coughs> during a high temperature. Mm. So, but I think that material is at least as good as paper insulation when it comes to degradation of insulation properties over the lifetime. So you would uh, you would expect the the, the, the passenger to, to to have the same lifetime? Basically. Yes, at least. No. But uh, I have no. I think so. But the fifty years are not done yet. No, that's the problem. You have to. <laughs> One question: <clears throat> If the water depth is more than two thousand meters, yes. Uh, what can you do then? Can you lay it? Uh, have it floated? Uh, some kind of loading equipment to attach to the cable and have it uh, loading around? No, I think normally you just put it on the seafloor 
without any burial. The sea floor is down to 3,000 meters. There's a valley and a seabed, and uh, then, the then I think, I think, I think uh, there are cables that goes over the valleys, etc. But then the cable must be mechanically strong enough, of course, to bridge that level without being tensioned too much, overstressed. Um, should we have a five minutes leg stretch? Yeah. <laughs>
I forgot to say here before we start here. I had some que cable questions. This is a three phase 400 kV cable. Uh, it's from uh, the Lilla Belt, Denmark. AC submarine cable. And I suppose this can handle something in the order of 800 amps. So that will be. Yes, 400, 4500 MBA. And that's a rather short distance. And the weight is considerable, I would say. Uh, if we compare them with an HDC cable pair, this can take approximately 1000 megawatt, and this takes half of it. And this can go unlimited distance. I think here we see why we have HDC submarine cables. I can pass it around. This is only a plastic cable, but it shows on one side the land cable with aluminium conductor, <coughs> on the other side the uh, submarine cable with a copper conductor. And I can pass it around here so you can go and I can pass this around also, but it's heavy. <laughs> If you want. So, by that, I think uh, we can now have the cable part finished. Are there any additional questions on cables or cable installations? Then I will go back to the system description. We started here with the HUD's introduction and the technologies, and now I will concentrate on the new technology, the HUD's Lite, and the applications in general, and we can see some reference installations and in the, in the future. Uh, so, if we make a short repetition, we say HUD's is special for low losses, long power transmissions, uh, overhead lines or submarine cables. Can connect asynchronous networks, have a price size, power flow control, thereby we can increase the stability in an existing network by adding parallel DC links. But and this is what we call line commutative technology with the HDC Classic. If we use the HDC light, it's a voltage source converter. It doesn't need to have any short circuit power to commutate and to work. It uh, can also use this XLP cables, which is has a uh, the weight is almost on the half compared to a conventional mass impregnated cable for the same cross section area. It can be connected to radial networks and passive loads. We control the power, even reactive power. Um, and the size is considerably smaller compared to the HDC Classic for the same power rating. Here is a 300-400 megawatt emission and you need a footprint of approximately 100 times 150 meters for such a station. 
And we see also here the rapid technology development. We started 1997 with the test installation. The first commercial was to the island of Gotland in Sweden, 1999. And today we will install 2014, 2015, the Scarborough 4, 700 megawatt at 500 k. Uh, if we look on the function here, when you buy an, or install an HVDC light, you will not only get the DC, AC to DC conversion, you will get an SVC or an STATCOM. At the same time, it's inherent. So if you combine the LCC concept with the LCC, SVC, you get the VSC functionality. Uh, and that means that we can produce, we can work in all four quadrants of a power and reactive power diagram here. So we can, at the same time, we are sending active power, we can absorb or generate reactive power within this area here. So it works like a motor or a generator. When it compares to, but the reaction time is in milliseconds here compared to a generator, which has a reaction time of seconds. The building element when developing this was that we have in-house development within ABB for all the important components. The converter technology with the semiconductors are developed for high voltage, high power in ABB. Our control and protection technology developed by HVDC ourselves. And we have the cable technology, the HVDC light cables, developed by our factory in Karlskrona. So it's all in all coordinated in-house development that made this possible. And uh, from the beginning, we had rather high losses in the HVDC light stations. We had about 3% per station. But today, with the new generations, we are down to 1% losses in the, in the stations. Then you have to add the cable losses or overhead line losses, of course. But still, losses are today so low that you will have lower losses than for an AC system. And it's compact and we maintain the functionality and availability and reliability. Um, with this new technology we have also increased the number of possible applications for HVDC. Traditionally we talked about interconnection grids. Uh, which has been done for the last 50 years. Countries between grids in the US, for example, by HVDC. Thereby secure the power supply, make it possible to buy and sell electrical energy, and also share uh, spinning reserves utilizing different peak loads in time by reducing the installed power in the networks. Instead of install more uh, power in a network, you can connect to another network. You can avoid the 
uh, installed power, uh, installation of more power, the investment there. And at the same time, we enable trading. Especially if you are in different time zones, then you can utilize with you. For example, in some countries, they have the peak low in the Middle East, in the middle of the day when the sun is very high and they have a lot of air conditioning. In other countries close by there, they don't have so much air conditioning due to that. that so the peak load is in the evening when everybody comes home and start to cook their food. Uh, I have spoke earlier about connecting remote renewable generation uh, with a long distance to the load centers. One example is this wind farms, offshore wind farms. Uh, then we have also what we say DC links in AC grids. And this is a <coughs> HVDC light application mainly. You can by having installing HVDC links in parallel with the existing AC links. And not only increasing the power in the new DC link, you can also increase the power transmission in the existing AC link. Since uh, you improve the AC grid stability and the reliability le level, you can avoid bottlenecks here and you can convert lines to DC lines, increasing the power transmission capability with a factor two or three, thereby avoiding discussions on new right away. And, and when you have a bended link, you will also have this reactive power or SVC functionality since that is inherent in the HUDC light converters. And it's possible to build what we say invisible transmission by using this uh, HUDC light cables and we can have these patients in a building looking like a barn or something like that. Also for uh, new oil and gas fields in the North Sea especially, there is a demand of power from shore, taking hydropower from shore from Norway to feed the oil and gas platforms, production platforms out in the North Sea reduce the CO2 emissions, reduce the operation and maintenance costs, increase the efficiency in space and weight of platforms. Uh, also, city center infield is the same here. Normally, when in Asia, you have these rapidly growing mega cities that require more and more power, but they have problems to get right away to get the power into the city center. And normally the only solution is to have cable, new cables added. And you can't add AC cables for more than a limited distance. So the only solution is they have to use the HVDC light technology. our experience here then? Well, we have been working now with this close to 60 years, the HVDC technology, and we have close to 80 installations globally. 
and uh, we have supplied more than half of the projects globally, worldwide. And I think this is updated last year, so we had 80, yes, 80 projects plus upgrades of existing plants as well. And uh, I will give you some examples. The longest cable could be interesting since you sooner or later might be connected to Europe. Why? Through a DC cable. The longest cable today is a cable between Norway and Netherlands. It's a 700 megawatt cable with a plus minus 450 kV system. It's 580 kilometers long. And the distance from Iceland to UK is almost a double, 1200 kilometers. But for HDC, that's not the problem from technical point of view, since we are only looking into the resistance of the cable. We can easily transmit over 1,200 kilometers. It's more a matter of the cost of the cable. Here it was to utilize the hydropower in Norway for peak power. They have also wind power connected, so when they have a low demand and much wind generation, the power direction will be the opposite. So it's a trading line here, but the main power direction is from Norway to Netherlands. And the losses of the total system, including the converter station here, is 3.7%, whereof the station has approximately 1.5%. In Italy, continental Italy, close to Rome, and to the Sardinia island, is an Two times 500,000 megawatt link installed to support the frequency and the network in Sardinia when they have very little generation there. So it is frequency and emergency support to Sardinia. Uh, if we then go over to the new technology, we have 20 projects installed or under execution. And uh, I would say that's 90% of the project, or 80 to 90% of the projects globally today in this technology. Um, some marks in 2002, we installed a link in the US between Connecticut and Long Island and 330 megawatt plus minus 150 kV light transmission system to improve the reliability of the power supply in these areas. Um, it also had a proven black start record. As you might uh, recall, there was a large disturbance 2000 2003 in US in the New York area and um, it was problem with the permits for the cable to have it in service due to fisher environment fishermen's here but uh, during this disturbance the gay permits directly and it contributed very much to the build up of the restriction of the network here again after this uh, outage. And after that, they get what this permit permanently, very fast. Uh, we have a link between Finland and Estonia. 
also 350 megawatt plus minus 150 kV was delivered on record time, 19 months. Uh, powered from shore, from uh, Norway mainland to a production platform, 300 kilometers out in the North Sea. A small system, but make it possible to take away all gas turbines on the platform, eliminating maintenance cost, uh, vibration, improving the what we call HSE uh, health and uh, security for the people on board there, and a more friendly working environmental air area. Uh, we have the ore wind, the first uh, offshore wind park in outside Germany. It's a 400 megawatt system consisting of both submarine cable and then land cable to the strong substation here that can evacuate the power further within Germany. In uh, Africa, in Namibia, <coughs> we have a HUDC light system of 350 kV, 300 megawatt. But this is what we call an asymmetrical system. So it can also be further developed to a symmetrical system with minus 300 kV an additional 300 megawatt. And this is more than 1,000 kilometers long overhead line here, from the desert here in Namibia, Windhoek, all the way to the Sambesi River here, where we have hydropower generation. And uh, it's worth to mention here that in this area, there is also a lot of uh, lightning activity that will uh, short circuit the overhead line. The system is very weak at both ends. So, uh, originally, this was ordered as a what we call HUDC classic system, but after the system studies it was agreed that we must have an HUDC light system in order to be able to control the systems or to control it. And this will enable future power trading in this area in Africa. So I think this is an example that we just not only had cables for HVDC lines. We also have overhead lines, and you can combine it. You can have several sections of overhead lines and several sections of cables, depending on the requirement that you have and the conditions where you want to go with the overhead lines or cables. The last one that we took in service this summer was a 500 megawatt a connection between Wales and Ireland. Uh, connect Ireland and UK for trading of electricity and also to support the future wind parks being built on Ireland. So we will support the frequency and the voltage here by this HDC light system. Also, possibilities to have black stock if you have an outage in this area. We are currently constructing also a 700 megawatt system between China and Sweden which will be in service 2015. And also here we talk about quick grid restoration, network stability, or 
integration in a future pan-European DCGrid. grid There will be a DC grid. We have a link to Finland. There is a fin from Finland to Estonia. There is a link here. So we're talking about the Baltic ring here now with DC links. Since the Baltic countries want to get rid of their uh, dependence from power from Russia. Uh, we also have a project ongoing between Norway and Denmark with Skagerrak 4, so we will work in combination with an old HUDC classic system with a new voltage for HUDC light technology 500 kV. So there is a lot of projects installed globally and we think we are the leader, especially in the light technology. And in the future, of course, we will have higher reliability, more compact solutions. Still, they will look on to have them environmentally adapted for the classic. We are already at 1100 kV for China. Light, we will have higher ratings in the future, higher voltages, lower losses. We're discussing also multi-terminal and eventually also DC grids What's with the, the DC is, breaker. The highest voltage on the cable. Today, the highest voltage is on the cable that I circulated, is 320 kV if you're using extruded flat with plastic insulation. But you can use also the massive impregnated cable for HVDC light applications. And that is the case for this uh, link between Skagerrak 4 between Norway and Denmark. They were using what we call mass impregnated cable for 500 kV, but we're using the ESC technology. Do you see any further development there in terms of voltage? Well, I think uh, if we look into the voltage on the light cable, I think. People are talking about 400 and 500 and 640 kV, but talk. when we will see it, I don't know. But I think um, definitely that both our competitors and <coughs> ourselves are working on higher voltages. There's also a lot of talk about DC grids with multi-terminal I mean, uh, stations that you have a DC grid you can tap off or feed in more power. And uh, this has been built, for example, we have a system which has been in service since 1992 in US. We were between and Canada, the high New England Hydro Quebec project. We have a new uh, in the classic in India now, and uh, this is possible as long as you regard this as one protection zone. If you want to have different protection zones here, then it will be required with a DC breaker which you might have read about in the newspapers and in the ABB press releases. The DC breaker is now, uh, we will install it as a pilot installation with a customer here in the near future. So it's not still commercially available. We have shown that this is the way how to do this and it's needed when you want to build a DC grid. 
and uh, the DC grid vision is shared. I think it started with this um, grid shown by ABB here, Desert Tech, when you should generate the power in Sahara with solar uh, power generation and then send the power to Europe through Spain, through Italy, through Turkey. Then it has been followed also by other initiatives, both in Australia, in uh, US as well, I think. But so there are a lot of discussions on DC grids, and I think we have started with the DC grid today, since a lot of our <coughs> latest <coughs> installations are pre had four DC multi terminals, both uh, physically and by the control itself. But there will be a DC grid sooner or later in order to be able to have both the renewables like wind, solar, and hydro integrated into a system. The question mark, will it take 20 years, will it take 50 years, or will it go faster or not? And why do we need a strong degree? If we look into what we, we have, the wind locations, where we have the hydro, Iceland and Norway, we know that the solar will produce in Africa, and we see it's long distances, and this has to work together in an integrated system. So if the wind stops blowing, we need hydropower from Iceland or Norway or from this part of Central Europe to support the geothermal, power. The geothermal is not in your picture. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Geothermal energy is not in your picture. No, it's uh, for stable, it's for the base load. I think you can't regulate the geothermal such a way, but I mean, for Iceland, I suppose that you have the majority is hydropower. Yes. And I don't know how the, uh, what you call, how the consumption curves is over day and night here. I don't know how stable it is, but you can definitely have geothermal power up to the minimum daily load. And then you can have a hydropower for the peak power load. So that is also very important when you're discussing here to export. What type of power are you going to export? So in order to do this, you need to have not only AC, you need a lot of DC links. And they have to be connected in some way or another. It will be in my opinion, I don't think we will see a complete DC grid, but we will see islands of DC grids in Germany, in Sweden, Norway, France, here, and we will see it in Italy, maybe down here. If it will be connected or not, we'll see. So this is future, and... Uh, and here in Iceland, I know also, you have a network here which has uh, potential for exporting power to Europe. You have today, I would say, one strong network with both production and consumption here. You have a one strong production and consumption here, and it's connected through this. 132 kV lines, which maybe are a little weak sometimes. And uh, in the future, I think there is solutions here, of course. Uh, you have the hydro and you have the geothermal. And if you're going to export 
think you need to reinforce your network with an HVDC light from this area to the other area in order to stabilize the network. Then, then you can add a link to your but if it will happen or when it will happen, up to you. We can support up you. <laughs> and if you want to read more, you can go to the ABD homepage where you can download a lot of material on the HVDC. We have a lot of films and publications and for those of you that are interested in cable installations, in cable laying, there are a lot of fun videos, I would say. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>